All right, I want to talk about point, line, and plane, which are the building blocks of visual design. So first, let's start with a point. A point is something geometrically uh, is a little bit different than it is in terms of what we're going to discuss in design. Geometrically speaking, you may have learned, um, you know, like in your mathematics classes, that a point is a very specific uh, place in space that has no um, width or height, but it is a point that occupies a space with some coordinates, right? Well, in design, to show that, we represent it with a dot. You represent it with a dot visually whenever you're talking about it in geometry too, but technically as soon as you make a dot, <laughs> it has width and it has height. So the ideas that we're going to be talking about in terms of using a point, it's going to be something that is kind of like a dot, right? It's it's a punctuated spot, right? Um, that doesn't have any length or width, you know, no kind of height associated with it specifically, even though if you were to look at this circle in front of us right now, you would say, well, that has a width and it has a height. The idea is that conceptually it represents a point, okay? So if we take two points and we connect them together, that would create a line. And in geometry, technically, uh, mathematics, uh, a line is comprised of a series of points in space that give it, um, you know, a, a single dimension, right? Well, in design, we take that and we sort of make it the visual representation so that, you know, you could have two points and you connect them with a line in between. And that also gets to the uh, it gets to vector graphics as well, where you'll learn later as we're doing stuff, say in Adobe Illustrator, if you have two points, two anchor points, and you would create a line in between, that's how you can manipulate what happens to the line, is by manipulating the line's end points, or even, you know, middle points, whatever. Okay, so that leads us then to the other concept, which is that of a plane, All right? A plane is going to be something that it adds another dimension or the, you know, the concept of another dimension so that you have a three-dimensional um, space. Even in our case, it would, you know, it's potentially a three-dimensional illusion uh, of space on a two-dimensional picture plane of some sort, right? So a plane is going to be something that occupies a width and a height. And that's what this is, in, in fact. And it has area. It, it's considered kind of like a surface, right? Something that represents some sort of surface. One of the things that you can also start to think about as we get into this point line plane concept is that at what point do points actually start to imply a line, right? And you'll notice that what I just did when I advanced to the slide, we went from something that was scaled really, really big. And so we didn't really get the sense of any kind of line, we got a sense of discrete separate points. But now if you look at this, your eyes want to put the pieces of the puzzle together and create a line here. So it's it's referred to as like implying a line. Okay, well, what about actually creating a line? You see that the, now they're all kind of overlapping shapes, they're intersecting each other, and it actually is creating a line. It's sort of a strange little caterpillar-like blobby line, but it's Technically, it looks like a line, right? So these are some of the things that you would start to think about in terms of like how scale is affecting things. And then like if, if you rearrange it with the proximity, when do those points start to create a plane, right? These are all the same points, but they're rearranged in such a way that they're sort of on top of each other. And they actually start to look a little bit like a plane. I mean, sort of a blobby plane, right? It's got these like little soft edges and bubbly shapes like a cloud. But... If you were to just glance at that, your eyes would start to, to formulate what looks like a square, okay? And so that would that would represent a plane. All right, so the point is you can, you know, you can see how scale, intersection, rotation, and proximity really affect our perceptions of the same objects. And that is why, you know, we're going to stick to the basics at first, you know, only manipulating proximity, this concept of proximity uh, in our first set of drawing studies, so that you can really kind of keep a limit on all of the variables that you're throwing in there, okay? Because it's, uh, it's, it's actually harder than you might think to make something that is sort of meaningful in terms of uh, studying the formal qualities, you know, of things like balance and repetition and things like that um, without actually adjusting all of the other uh, aspects like scale and, you know, overlapping them and stuff like that. Okay, so 
Um, and a lot of times people will find that this is more challenging than they thought it would be because otherwise they sort of almost seem like kind of boring little pictures, right? But if you restrict yourself to proximity variance, it forces you to focus specifically on the spatial relationships without all those other complexities, you know, scale, color, value, rotation, overlapping shapes, right? It really makes you start to think about those spatial relationships, like things like the concepts of grouping, separation, all of that, and you know, how it can become meaningful. Whenever you are exploring the concept of balance, you're going to try to have to intentionally create symmetry or asymmetry based on grouping, separation, positive and negative space. Um, sometimes we also refer to that as figure ground space. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later, not specifically in this assignment with figure ground. That'll come a lot more when we get into scale. But um, I'm just throwing that out there so that you do understand that it's a version of positive and negative. You'll still have positive and negative space without having um, any kind of ambiguous foreground and background, um, but figure ground is oftentimes something that we talk about whenever we're referring to um, sort of the ambiguity of what is what is the foreground and what is the background. Let's look at some ideas like balance through symmetry. If you look at these, you'll notice how the white space, right, or the negative space is evenly spaced on either side of the dark active areas and they become focal points those those darker active areas right and so here you see in red is where i'm highlighting all of that white space that ends up balancing it to create symmetry and so balancing something with symmetry i think most of us probably know what symmetry is it's where you've got something that's almost like bilateral meaning that it's got two halves or roughly approximate halves even that are the same Right, and so if you look at this, you could look at the top picture having the the dots that are um, diagonal into the corner. Well, even if it's on a 45 degree axis, it creates those dots create a 45 degree axis line for the um, the corners, sort of those corner spaces on the top right and the bottom left having a balance, right? That That's pretty obvious to a lot of people. Symmetrical balance is, I think, a lot easier to understand for a lot of people than asymmetrical balance. So let's look at asymmetry. If you look at this, uh, look at the top one, for instance, what's happening is, um, actually in both of them, uh, you're creating this balance through a visual tension. Um, so even though it's asymmetrical, it doesn't mean that it's not balanced. And the reason that this is working for both of these is that the proximity of the groupings, they create visual weight, you know, like the heavier dark areas. But our eyes pull to the top, you know, the, the little outlier element, um, because our eyes are always, our minds are always wanting to put pieces of a puzzle together. And so if we see something that's sort of off to the side, then immediately our eyes are going to be drawn to it. And so where you place that, that extra thing that's the outlier, it will make a difference as to how successful the composition is a lot of times because you still want to be able to allow somebody's eyes to move throughout the entire space. And that's what's actually working really well is that you know the result is that whenever our eyes are pulled up to that other element, it's referred to as activating space. So all that white space that's negative space, it activates something that otherwise might have been inactive because our eyes have to sort of traverse that space to go up and put the other piece of the puzzle together, that, that outlying element. And then our eyes then naturally sort of have to either, like in the example of the top picture, it sort of circles around to, to kind of create that to create that unity. Um, and in the example of the bottom picture, our eyes are kind of moving up and down. Like whether you realize it or not, that's a lot of times what's gonna happen is that your eyes sort of vibrate back and forth between that top element and the second the uh, second set of four lines in the bottom. And those bottom ones, because of the way that they're grouped, they become almost like their own element. They are not discrete and separate lines when you glance at them, you look at those as a visual element, and then you look at that top line as a visual element, and then you're trying to sort of mitigate the space that's in between them. Same is true for that top picture with the, the planes, where we look at that grouping in the sort of lower right corner of four squares as a single unit because of their proximity. And then if you look at that top piece, it's the outliner, outlier, but because it's still part of the picture plane, you're gonna look at it and try to pull and tie everything together.
And so that's creating balance through asymmetry. And then it's important to understand that whenever people look at artwork, no matter how simple it is, that people will attribute meaning to almost everything. And we interpret meaning from even the simplest spatial organization. If you take a look at some of these, you can try to see before the slide advances, kind of get an idea if the artist's intention was communicated, right? Because people had some words and then they made decisions about how to arrange the lines to kind of convey that meaning. Let's look at these, right? So the lines in the center, that was congestion. And the, the ones, the dots on the bottom, the points on the bottom, that's playfulness. And you can kind of get a sense of those things because with congestion, you know, you think of what that means. It means that there's a lot that's sort of jammed in to one tight spot. And I think that that is pretty successful in communicating that. Also, that's the idea of that congestion is it's going to look heavier. It's going to look impacted, right? Um, and so that, that heavier, darker value that's created just by putting those lines adjacent to each other is giving us that feeling of like compression, right? Um, and then playfulness, you know, the curvature, of the implied line that you get by putting those dots in roughly equal distance but then curving them off to the edge that's kind of a lighter playful approach like if you had taken that same approach with even spacing and you put them all in a straight line that wouldn't necessarily feel playful it would feel like it had a little bit more order possibly so yeah and you also can look at these things and think about interval like are the spaces in between these things are they the same or are they different? Are some spaces uh, in between the elements bigger or smaller than other spaces between other elements? Okay, you take a look at this. All right, and so the top one you can see was conflict. So you can see that there's this grouping at the top and then there's this outlier element, All right? So that's conflict. Um, or that's how this person interpret that, interpreted that word. And they used it kind of as a guiding principle when they were trying to think about groupings. Uh, and then the bottom one, that's what they came up when they came up with order. Um, not only are the boxes evenly spaced, but they are approximately symmetrically lining up through the middle. There's a little more space possibly on the left, but um, essentially it is a symmetrical composition. So the top one's congestion, the bottom one's peace. And there's a sense of peace uh, because there's like a, a little bit of a vibration and then almost like a sort of an outflow that's evenly pushing out from the center of those lines to the top and the bottom line. So it's like a sort of a relaxed vibration almost that it creates. Okay, so just because these foundations are simple doesn't mean that they are simplistic. All right, I want to look at some work that's professional that employs a lot of these fundamental principles and they're plain as day, all right, so that it can help you understand. This is something by Firebelly Design. It's a book. It's just one spread from the book. <clears throat> but you'll see as the screen starts to add more and more of these overlays on the, the planes and the points and the um, lines, you'll start to see how you know something that you might think oh my gosh this is such fundamental stuff it's too boring right it starts from somewhere right it you know and this is where we get this idea right so if you take a look at something like this it starts to look a little bit more like a layout but still if you look back at what we're going to be doing even though you're not combining point line and plane yet and you're not overlapping the shapes and stuff i just want to point out that the stuff that we're starting with you know, I think some people are a little confused and maybe even a little impatient with some of it sometimes, but you're going to get to stuff that's more complicated, but it really helps for you to really think about these relationships without the complexities of all these other things of having stuff overlap and adding color and scaling things and rotating things. It really does make it easier for you to figure out some simple relationships between elements, especially when we're talking about space, before you start adding all of those other um things into it. And so now I want you to break it down. You can just look at some of these and uh, you can think about sort of like what we just looked at. You can think about um, how you could easily break these other professional works down so that you start to see them in terms of where the point line and plane stuff actually is. All right. So um, and these are these are things that you've actually seen from previous lecture. Um, so or a previous lecture. And so you can take a more critical look 
based on uh, the design foundations. All right, so this is one that Pentagram did uh, for Nesta. It's a British company, remember? And this is real, I don't even have to explain it. You can totally see the basic fundamental shapes that we're working with here, okay? And then here's more of the same. It's beautiful and it's adding color and we've got things like rotation and axis, all right? But we're gonna get to that. I just want you to see that even some of the stuff that you might think seems very fundamental and simple and basic, you know, it, it exists out there with these companies that charge lots and lots of money for their design. Um, they're out there doing some stuff that looks really elegant, slick, nice, all right? Um, okay, this is um, uh, an older campaign for Saks Fifth Avenue, but you can look at that and immediately start to understand positive, negative space, basic planes and points, and you get the idea with that too, okay? And here, this is Sagmeyer Walsh. We, uh, for Levi's billboard that they did, of course, these little um, saw blade gear things, they turn and all of the, the typography gets mismatched and stuff It's kind of interesting. But, you know, take a look at this and start to figure out like, where do the points come into play? You know, uh, where do the planes come into play? Where's a point also a plane? How are lines working in this? Especially if you think about this, whenever those wheels turn, what happens to the typography? Do they just become a series of sort of chaotic lines, right? And how does that get your attention? That kind of stuff. The other thing I would say about something like this is uh, you can also look at the edges. We haven't gotten here yet, but if you look at the edges of the those gears, you can also start to get this implied texture as well. We haven't really talked about texture, but we will later. And then... This, lastly, you can look at this. It's a hand uh, lettering piece by a, a hand lettering artist. And then, you know, you can start to break this down too. I mean, yes, it's typography, but look at all of the other stuff. Like, where are the points? You know, how are how is the type generated? Look at all of the planar surfaces that are on there. Look at how the curvilinear lines from the vines, look at how those kind of counteract the very planar blocky lettering, you know, and so that it starts to actually blend all of these things like industrial space, because think about this as an industrial space and it's in a garden. Uh, it's actually the painting that is uh, in front of a garden for a restaurant in an industrial urban space. And so think about how those those ideas are communicated through this piece of artwork, you know, in terms of like the, the very um, solid, heavy duty, planar typography versus the very organic curvilinear lines that are um, coming out of it, right? So anyway, uh, that will get you started. All right, you can dive in and begin your first explorations and then it will get more interesting when you move on to the next assignment and so on. But this should be a good introduction for you to start thinking about these kinds of relationships.